The dice had been cast, and there was no turning back now. Despite what many may think, Travis Stambrosia was far from thrilled. Contrary to the belief of many that America was chomping at the bit to kick zombie ass, he and many other officials were cautious at best. For a start, their estimates said they'd be trying to clear out 200 million zombies. Even with all the knowledge and technique that they now had, he didn't view the proposition as anything more than gloomy. He also didn't like the idea of sending thousands of people to their deaths if things went wrong. His side needed to be bred, fed, and led. They had people, but he wasn't sure if there'd be enough numbers-wise. They had gear, and could only hope it would be enough combat-wise. Then they had leadership, but he wasn't sure if they'd learned enough. And if they hadn't, that'd be his failing. The enemy they were against could potentially grow their ranks by thinning his. No supply chains to sever, no generals to capture... Every zombie was a unit and an army by itself, able to join a great swarm or infect more to its cause by biting. So often news described people as being at total war, when he believed this was an impossible state to be in. Not every action was devoted to war, nor every person on your side or the opposition. Yet he believed this to be the case with the undead, because they didn't view it as war. For them, infecting more humans wasn't a struggle or a personal offensive. It was just the basic goal of their whole existence. It's all they were on Earth to do. It was an enemy with no ability to surrender, and they wouldn't stop until all of them were down. And now, they had to fight 200 million of them. Or rather, everyone on the ground had to. Todd Wayno wasn't exactly chomping at the bit for round two against the undead. It wouldn't necessarily be his second rodeo. He'd been involved in spring sweeps and street clearing in LA, and other bits of the safe zone since Yonkers, but was still very much on edge. Things were different now. The Mop 4 was gone, replaced with navy blue uniforms with Kevlar over the top that made them look more like SWAT teams. The tanks and treads were gone and replaced with Humvees, and now they had to walk everywhere too marching on foot like a medieval legion with their lobos in hand. Firearm-wise, they had the new standard infantry rifle. Basic, no frills, no automatic, and just a few extra adjustments like a scope or more barrels for different ranges. It was accurate, simple, and could be drop-kicked through a swamp and still work fine afterwards. It also came with a bayonet for close quarters, and they had a new ammunition for it too, the cherry pie round. Pi standing for pyrotechnically initiated explosive. The incendiary shots would incinerate the zombie's brain on entry. The people were now new as well. The army had shifted considerably with its drive for new recruits. There was still basic training you had to pass, but now it contained people from all walks of pre-war life. Wayno's battle buddy was Sister Montoya, a 52-year-old nun who'd held off the hordes coming for her Sunday school with just an iron candlestick. Their testing ground for all their new gear and theory would be outside the town of Hope, New Mexico. The top brass said it was for the terrain, the mountains in the back for a natural boundary, and the desert in front for a good line of sight. Absolutely nothing to do with the fact that they'd learned a great deal about the value of psychology in battle after Yonkers and Roy Elliott's films. Speaking of, it was just too tempting for him to resist. The Battle of Hope was the first of his films on the retaking portion of the war, but Wayno scoffs at its realism. Far from the good-natured banter, harmonica playing, and slapping of thighs or rifles, as Elliot depicted, everyone was tense and silent. It was a camp of clenched jaws, white eyes, and nervous ticks. At 1300 hours, the radios began to squawk and warble. The herding dogs sent out to lure the zombies were bringing them back now, and they could see hundreds of them beginning to dot the horizon. The dogs raced back behind their lines, and they activated their primary enticement mechanism. Again, they claimed they just needed something loud to keep the zombie attention on them, and the fact that blaring Black Sabbath psyched up the troops was merely coincidental. The British used bagpipes, the South Africans Zulu war chants, and they had heavy metal. And it worked. 
Wayno did admit to feeling a lot better with the music gassing him up. And when the players stopped and the command to fire came, the wave of gunfire didn't sound too unconvincing either, when the line of undead dropped before it. They had strict orders to only shoot the zombies that crossed over their set markers, always taking out the closest ones first. When your battle buddy emptied their clip and held up their rifle, that was your sign to hop in and take their place while they reloaded. When Wayno sprung into action, he still remembers the first zombie he dropped in the Battle of Hope. Dirty blonde hair hanging in clumps, a swollen belly bulging through a black t-shirt saying G is for gangster, and clouded blue eyes. He put a round right between them and was locked in. They trained with metronomes back at base, so they could achieve a steady rate of fire at one shot per second ideally. It may sound like a lot, but with the size of the hordes, they weren't lacking for targets. The recharge teams, or sandlers, rushed up and down the lines collecting empty clips and changing them for full ones, which they needed with the constant flow of undead. The brass watched everything from a tower set up, and with their satellites and drones manned by Knox and his crew on the ISS, they could survey the greater battlefield too. Seeing the numbers coming in, they commanded the men to form into a Raj Singh, or RS, the combat square first made by the good general himself in the Battle of Gandhi Park. This was a risk should they be overrun, but with the vehicle convoy they'd brought with them being stacked to the roofs with ammunition, as well as what they'd brought on foot, they had plenty this time. But being surrounded was still a risky move that left many uncomfortable, hence why combat shrinks had been brought with them too. If they noticed minute changes in their success rate in hitting the undead, or their rate of fire, they'd give them a tap on the shoulder to pull out and recharge. Which helped, considering the battle lasted most of 15 hours. In their later stages, the amount of slain undead had formed literal walls surrounding them, and all they had to do was drop any poking their heads over the top as they climbed it from the other side. In the night portion of the battle, they used red spotlights to illuminate things, which gave the slightly worrying side effect of giving the zombies red glowing eyes for a second when the cherry pie impacted their head. The last shot was fired around dawn, as the sun rose over the mountainous ring of corpses that surrounded them. Bulldozer Humvees had to clear a path to get them out, and the Lobos were used to dispatch any trapped ghouls squashed between their slain comrades. The unit left as Battlefield Sanitation arrived to deal with the mess, and they were allowed to sleep in as long as they wanted the next day. Then things began to look a lot more like the Roy Elliott film. The caution was gone and they'd survived the whole thing with no casualties on their side. Positivity was creeping back in, and whilst the road ahead was long, it began to feel like the beginning of the end. As well as the dogs being used to lure in the undead, they had numerous uses over the course of the war. As first seen in Israel, they were initially used to screen for the undead, a technique that caught on across much of the globe. Such cages were necessary, as the dogs would often go berserk on smelling the infected, and would often wound those around them in a panicked frenzy. Darnell Hackworth doesn't blame them, having developed something of a soft spot for them, with his job now running a retirement home, for the old K-9 Corps used in the war. With the higher-ups obviously deciding further training was needed, dogs in the safe zones intended for anti-zombie use were conditioned early. When still just pups, they were put in a room with a mesh screening separating them from a zombie. In a classic test of shyness versus boldness, those that fled didn't progress, but those that showed boldness and aggression went on to further training. But that was just the first step and between selection and the hopeful idea of graduation, 60% ultimately didn't succeed. The training on both dog and master was gruelling, and they were the first division to actually use the living dead in their training, being a guinea pig themselves to see if it was a viable strategy. As well as being lures, like in the Battle of Hope, the dogs could also be used as decoys if the people needed more time to set up holding the zombies at bay and leading them on wild goose chases until they were ready to be received. There was also the lemming strategy, discovered when a dog began to bark from a rooftop at a tower block full of zombies, causing them all to blindly stumble over the edge in pursuit and save a risky tower raid. 
The most common use was the basic sweep and clear. Before people entered certain areas, the dogs and handlers would go first to check for hidden ghouls that only the dogs could sniff out and the handlers would then dispatch. An essential job, especially in grassy or muddy areas where a single bite would spell doom for the infantry. Long-range patrol was where the dogs were sent into dense or urban areas where satellites and drones at the time couldn't go, with video uplink harnesses like the Land Warrior system to gather intel for further missions. Whilst the top brass were pleased with this idea, and surprisingly, the handlers hated it. Hackworth had to go through it multiple times, as he and his dogs were all urban specialists. Mitchell, in Oregon, was left full of live zombies and then fenced off, to be used as a training ground for urban warfare dogs and handlers. Despite the name, many graduates were often terriers, whose small size made them ideal for urban recon. Hackworth himself worked with the Dachshund Cross, Maisie, over the bulk of the strikeback period. In the lower density infestation areas, it was much less the zombies that were the problem, so much as other dogs. Common, hungry packs of feral strays were highly abundant in the lesser infested areas, and replaced zombies as the primary predators of everything that lived there, including people. The swift, agile recon dogs usually weren't breeds well equipped for combat, so they often had escorts to help. Maisie had Pongo and Purdy, a Rottweiler mix and a shepherd dog cross. Huge, strong and fierce, they regularly sent feral packs fleeing with their tails between their legs, and more than once saw active combat of their own. They always walked away from it, their opponents couldn't say the same. When they encountered zombies, they changed tactics. With the flesh being toxic, they couldn't maul the undead, but instead floored them and fled. In the early days of the war, it wasn't uncommon to find the untouched bodies of dogs, either service dogs or family pets defending their owners that had ingested infected flesh while biting ghouls. It was an important part of their training to teach them not to use their instinctive weapons against the undead. Whilst the dogs were generally too nimble to be caught, in some cases wounds were taken if they had a fall or became trapped. If close enough, their handlers could still pick them up. In other cases, they petitioned for mercy charges, small explosive devices to give them an instant death if they couldn't be reached in time. This was hand-waved by distress as a waste of resources, although the idea of dogs being used like anti-tank mines was briefly considered. Hackworth believes this was dropped for fear of another Eckhart incident. Another senior handler, Sergeant Eckhart, was doing a long-range patrol outside of Little Rock when their partner fell down a ditch and broke their leg. With the swarm fast approaching, she rushed to try and get them, but was stopped by an officer spouting regulations. She responded by blowing his head off, and was tackled down by other personnel, all the while hearing her beloved companion being eaten alive over the radio. For that, as per the Wacko's rules, she was publicly hung in a broadcast they made sure to reach everyone. Changes were made though, and after that handlers were allowed to go after their dogs, regardless of risk to themselves. The unique and incredible bond between their dogs and their handlers was their great success and failing. It made them an unparalleled unit when together, but they also had the highest suicide rate of any division. Hackworth himself was handpicked for the job when the army came across him in the Great Panic. He had been walking, or more accurately limping, for three months since he had escaped Atlanta when he came across a pair of men starting a fire, and prepping their cutlery. Behind them a dog lay whimpering, muzzle and paws bound with shoelaces. Hackworth can't really remember what happened, all he knows is he broke one of their arms, and was smashing the other's face in, when the army found them and pulled him off, right before they decided they had a job for him. Despite this incredible passion, the funny thing is Hackworth wasn't always a fan of dogs. Before the war, he was a proud and self-confessed dog hater, refusing to even stroke friends' pets. He lived close to a pet store, and when the dead descended on Atlanta, they massed outside its gates attracted by the panicked whimpers of the puppies within. 
One by one, Hackworth listened to them fall silent as their water bottles ran dry, and he used the last of them to make his own escape undetected. Still ridden with the guilt, he has little idea about what he could have even done, other than just something. In the Holy Russian Empire, not all settlements are looking livable post-war. We meet Father Sergei Rizkov in a shanty town without electricity or running water. And he's hardly in better condition, with multiple healed broken bones, a limp and missing teeth. As with prior conflicts, one of Russia's greatest allies was General Winter. They were quick to capitalise on smashing frozen zombies, but really the Winters were for reorganisation and resource distribution, and the zombies within their own borders was but a fraction of their opposition. Unlike the US, they fought a war on two fronts the Ural boundary to the west, and the Central Asian swarms from the southeast. They had no equivalent to distress or anything so neat and tidy, but they did have tons of Soviet-era resources to use. They fought with old war weapons, and wore mouldy woolen tunics that scarcely protected from the cold, let alone bites. Half the time their guns jammed or ammo failed, and they had a high casualty rate. Their battles were sloppy and brutal, plastering zombies in endless machine gun fire to physically tear them apart, drowning them in baths of fire from flamethrowers that engulfed entire towns, and crushing them beneath the treads of prehistoric tanks. They did learn, though, and after so many costly offensives on cities, they eventually took to just walling them up over cleaning them out. But in many places, the price had already been paid, with no handy and merciful pills like the Americans had in case of a bite, they only had bullets, with the officers often having to euthanise their own men. It's hardly a surprise many of their best and experienced men felt a desertion, alcoholism or taking their own lives. Things were so bad, people wound up calling it the second decimation. They then organised the wounded after every battle, into doomed groups. It was Rizkov's job to collect the letters for their families, offer a final drink of vodka or cigarettes for some Dutch courage, and to do the last rites afterwards. Until one day when observing this final ritual, Rizkov felt an overwhelming compulsion to act, and undertook the process himself. Suicide was a sin, and getting the officers to do it had lost too many officers. Getting the soldiers themselves to do it cost them their souls. No more sinning. No more souls resigned to hell. As chaplain, he was the one to tend to his flock. And if that meant the slaughter too, then that was his God-given responsibility. He spread his message to every field chaplain and civilian priest throughout Russia, and was one of the key factors in beginning its transformation to the Holy Empire. They needed direction, courage, and hope, and now they had all of that through faith. The president later declared himself the head of the church, and Rizkov is reluctant to think about what happened after that, the events that led to his falling out with Moscow, and how his and their beliefs were co-opted into death squads, purifying the non-believers who just so happened to disagree with the president, but he still takes his own role as chaplain seriously to any who need it. Michael Choi claims his war hasn't ended yet, and he's still in active service fighting the undead. Perhaps he's right, and for everyone too, with his job showing just how prevalent the remaining zombie population is. Plenty still wash upon shore, or get snagged in nets, and his job now is to take Deep Glider 7 to the depths for more info. A veteran of the Deep Submergence Combat Corps, he never had to use chainmail or shark suits in his dives, but rather atmospheric diving suits, 1950s looking inventions that allowed for quick surfacing, deeper depths and longer submersion. The downsides were their hugely limited mobility, but Choi wouldn't trade their extra protection for anything. He had seen mesh divers survive dives with broken bones from being mauled by so many zombies that failed to break the skin, or who were suffocated when their regulator was torn from their mouth. Some simply couldn't break free before their air ran out, or managed to escape with too little time 
and rushed back to the surface, letting an embolism or the bends finish what the dead started, none of which posed a risk for Choi and the others in ADS. They even had the luxury of rocketing back up to the surface like a cork, although sometimes they had to be cautious on pickup if a zombie had managed to hang on for the journey. But with a 48-hour life support system, actually having to ascend in a hurry was rare. If one of them got snagged, they'd often tell the others to go on and pick them up at the end. Choi had the Mark I exosuit, one of the most sci-fi looking of them all, and light enough to swim in too. It had no true weapons, but it perhaps didn't need them. All you had to do was grasp a zombie's head and squeeze. Eventually, things got even more sci-fi, and they got a wrist-mounted gun that fired steel rods too. This came after one particularly stressful battle under a Norwegian oil rig. Protection aside, fighting in the black, silty water with no hearing or touch and only what you could see from your faceplate was a traumatic experience for all involved. The civilian oil workers in just dry suits refused to go back down until their escorts had some proper weaponry. As well as escorting and maintenance, they also did some early sweeps too. One of their tasks was beachhead sanitation, essentially luring and clearing the already underwater zombies away, so the land troops could do a proper amphibious landing without getting slaughtered. Harbour clearing was more stressful. When humanity took to the seas in the Great Panic, they often dumped what was already on the yachts, and anything frivolous they didn't need, and now such debris had to be cleared to reopen lanes for deep water shipping. Murky water was bad enough, but a sea of flotsam and jetsam hid every zombie waiting for them. But the worst was clearing sunken ships, the rotting, groaning hunks of metal that had often sank with hundreds of zombies on board. Protected as he was, Choi never felt more claustrophobic in his suits than when indoors underwater. He denies having nightmares over it, but his worst memory was crashing through the deck into an engine room filled with zombies being trapped in a floating sea of grasping limbs and snapping teeth. Happily, Choi is now more research-based, and patrols the desert-like floors of the undersea world, now often with just barren sand, with much coral and seaweed trampled by the hordes. Finally, he finds his quarry, a group of sixty or so dressed in rags, if that, and ghostly white under the lights. Much as he'd like to wipe them out, his job is instead to study them. Deep Glider 6 comes equipped with radio darts, essentially bugging the zombies so they have tabs on different hordes, and can monitor their undersea movements. With estimates of between 60 and 70 million zombies shuffling around on the sea floor, they're a vital faction of the enemy to keep an eye on. Should they emerge en masse, it could undo years of fighting and rebuilding. This is one of his last dives, and soon this program will be reshaped into ROV dives and tagging, without a man needed underwater. Choi is less than pleased, believing it to be ridiculous when they never lost a man, and the ADS they had were the safest way to enter the ocean. But chiefly, he's saddened by the loss of the human element, and fears what may happen with just machines and no human skill or intuition. In Quebec... André Renard has all but stopped caring about the dead, but living in a small cabin in the woods, he doesn't much care for the living either. He has since grown sick of hearing everyone else's war stories, and each one claiming they had the toughest campaign, fighting in a jungle or city. He believes his was the toughest, and he fought beneath one, with his campaign taking him to the Paris catacombs. For Parisians in the Great Panic, their big idea wasn't to head north, but to head underground instead. Word quickly spread, and a quarter of a million people stuffed themselves underground and sealed the door. There was no organisation, and not enough food or tools brought, but none of that mattered. They didn't properly screen for the infected, and their fate was sealed from there on out. Re-entering the catacombs was a nightmare, they were woefully under-equipped, with only one pair of night vision goggles per group, and red torches for everyone else, and then batteries for just a few of those. 
Visibility only got worse when they had to wear gas masks, or whatever else would filter the air toxic with sewage and rotting flesh, that only dulled their senses further. Even the maps they had were now useless too, with the amount of extra tunnels the fleeing Parisians had initially dug before conversion as well. They really were flying blind, and many got lost, sometimes even for days at a time. They could hear, though, perhaps too well, as it was arguably worse. Screams and shouts were amplified, as were the moans of the undead, and they often heard fellow groups engage in combat with no way to know which tunnel they were down, only being able to listen. By the time they found them, they were often too late to help, and sometimes even so late, they then had to put down their own countrymen. Their close-quarter combat was as close as it could get, with them often finding the zombies by turning a corner and stumbling right into them, or the undead suddenly lurching from a hidden passage. The very air itself was flammable, and so no conventional firearms were allowed. They had air carbines, but a lot of their fighting was done with whatever makeshift weapons they could find or make. Renard was lucky, and formed himself an effective trench spike for the closest quarter combat he could manage. It was claustrophobic and traumatic, and in the resulting stress, people would often remove their masks to breathe, and suffocate on the bad air, or drown in the bad water. After heavy rains, the catacombs were flooded, and in some places they had to crawl through waist-deep water full of the same sewage and rot that was poisoning the air. The floor was full of flooded holes too, often containing the undead. Sometimes the person in front of you would vanish, falling face down into them and getting pulled under. Or, as you tried to help pull them out, through the mask you'd see their eyes bulge in panic a final time as they were snatched away. In some cases, the flooding was so bad they called in the costos, the cave divers. As if cave diving wasn't dangerous enough already, they now had to hunt the undead in such a situation. They had one of the lowest survival rates of any division in the whole war, with just 1 in 20 making it out of their offensive. Of their entire strike force, 15,000 perished in the liberation of Paris in just three months. The French leadership pushed a rapid and dangerous campaign, keen to restore pride and honour to their reputation that they believed had been tarnished after past conflicts. One lost was Renard's own brother. When clearing an underground hospital initially believed to be built in the Nazi occupation of the catacombs, they blew a wall and in an instant had 300 zombies now on their hands. His voice was the last thing they could hear over the radio of that struggle. On ne passe pas. In his new home of Denver, Colorado, Todd Wayno reminisces, if that's the word for it, about what they called the road to New York. The goal was to advance as one over the Midwest, then split into three at the Appalachians, one north, one central, and one south, with Wayno in the northern contingent. They succeeded, but overall it took them three years, thanks to a mix of terrain, weather, the fact they were on foot, and had no shortage of enemies. They couldn't stop for every ghoul, so instead had what was called force-appropriate response. A small chunk of the main unit would detach to deal with a threat that was then replaced by the second leg, with the detached chunk then sliding back in at the rear guard. They also only walked in the day. Night marches were a big no-go, no matter how safe they thought they might be. This slow progress did give their neighbouring countries time to get their own affairs in order too. Mexico and Canada didn't have the remaining manpower to clear out their own countries, but instead agreed to prevent zombies crossing into the US until they were finished, at which point they'd then assist them in their own liberation. Their official strategy was to surround urban areas, set up their firing zones and temporary bases, then keep calling the undead out until they stopped coming. It sounded ideal, but was marred by the urban sprawl of America. Where exactly did one draw the line between city and sprawl, and decide where to pitch their tents, especially when both had zombies by the dozen? Often they wound up fighting for days through cookie-cutter neighbourhoods of infested sprawl before they could draw their city boundary line. Though he wasn't going to brag, 
Wayno initially thought he'd lucked out getting into the northern contingent. With their zombies frozen for half the year, it should be a cakewalk, really. Eight months, even, if the weather was bad. Psychologically, though, it only wound up making him feel uncomfortable. With their zombie cohort frozen and stationary, sometimes buried under the grey snow for months, they could be missed, even with the sniffer dogs. Typically, the southern units cleared an area to completion, whereas they always felt like they had the risk of missing a frozen zombie that later came back to bite them. They had plenty of quizlings, winter-ready and as dangerous as any true zombie. Sometimes they had a fight on their hands, other times they worked with the human reclamation units, a branch of human resources that essentially worked as animal control, but for people... They'd try and dart and capture them to be shipped off to rehabilitation centres. Like many, Wayno is sceptical at most of the chances of their rehabilitation, and believes it a waste of time. Then there were the ferals. Many were no longer just kids, and had become full-grown adult feral humans. They were now fast and smart, veterans of living in the shadows as human animals in the zombie apocalypse and if they chose fight over flight, then fight they could. Similar to the Quislings, official orders were to try and bring them in alive for rehabilitation, but ferals were fierce and unwilling to go down without a fight. Tranquilizers took time to work, and some members of the human resources were killed in action. Wayno and the other members of the army were not so gentle, and initially had no problems dropping them on sight. The sound of someone that was still human screaming from a cherry pie round in their gut gave some of them pause for thought, though. As well as feral people, they had feral animals, too. As well as the ravening packs of feral dogs being bad enough, even the cats posed a problem. Typically dubbed either F-lions or flies, Wayno insists on them being part mountain lion. While some likely were the true and scarce remnants of cougar populations across the US, He may not be wrong about them being unusually large and being part something else. Savannah cats are domestic cats crossed with a serval, a leggy species of African felid. At over 20 pounds, they're a lot larger than any normal pet cat, and are considerably stronger to match. Plenty presumably went feral in the apocalypse, and survived better with more of their wild instincts intact. There are also anecdotes about pure feral cats becoming very large in places like Australia, although many such accounts need proper verification. Unlike the dogs who would charge into harass or try and hunt the humans, the more shy F-lions would prefer to hide and let them pass by. Only when they got too close to one did it leap out and attack. Whilst the assorted sniffer dogs loved it, finally having something to chase again, Wayno himself was pounced on by several and received his own set of scars across his face. Luckily, their body armour kept them safe from a lot of feral animals, but it was most needed for the people. A lot of the shots they had to duck weren't meant maliciously. In a way. Many lone or small groups of survivors had just become so paranoid and jumpy that they reflexively shot at anything that wasn't themselves, and when talked down, were often happy to be integrated. As such, they became known as Robinson Crusoes. Lamos, on the other hand, stood for last man on earth, nutcases who had styled themselves warlords of the quizzling and feral-filled wastes, and would rather die before they gave up that title. In some cases, they'd amassed a considerable following, and those were some of the rare instances they reassembled the military pre-Yonkers too, bringing back automatic weapons and grenades to stamp them out. After Chicago, all squads were issued pamphlets with the Threat Pyramid, breaking down the likely enemies they were going to encounter, how to deal with them, and the probability of encounter. As such, the undead everyone knew well were at the bottom, as the standard and most common enemy that was also their primary goal to defeat in the Easterly Campaign. F-critters and ferals then made up the middle ranks, the masses of wild people and animals that had managed to cling to survival, in lower-density infestation areas, and now provided dangerous resistance in some places. Quizlings were rarer, but a similarly lethal threat, especially in winter, 
and the carnivorous hordes were at full abundance without the true undead to compete with. And lastly, and perhaps most dangerously, the Lamos, the gun-wielding kings of their own creation. None of this is also to say that the dead went down easily. On the road to New York, infestations were vastly beyond even Yonkers, and anything they could have expected. A three-day battle with considerable casualties ensued, that made the Battle of Hope look like the dummy run it really was. When it came to the liberating, reactions were mixed. Some of the military bases they relieved seemed to be having such a good time of things why no wonders why they needed relieving, and why they couldn't swap roles for a quick holiday. In other cases, just a few of the stories he heard made him almost miss Yonkers. The civilians were generally a lot more positive, and a lot of the time it felt like the black and white pictures of post-war parades. For all the partying and pleasurable company they received, though, Wayno and many others had difficulty shaking the faces of those who weren't happy to see them. Those asking where they were a week or a year ago, or why they'd been abandoned to start with. Some settlements begrudgingly accepted being reabsorbed back into America, but had nothing at all positive to say to the army. Some true and full-blown rebel settlements were deemed too dangerous for just Wayno and his rank, and special units were deployed. Whilst he never saw the combat, he heard of what went down, and it was the only time Wayno had seen active tanks since Yonkers. For all the quaint threat pyramids, there were still plenty invisible dangers too. Illness was one, and disease was more prevalent now than it had ever been in the past 100 years, with pathogens once thought harmless or defeated now causing serious death tolls. Traps and bombs left by survivors for the zombies caused serious casualties, and the mines that zombies walked over only turned them into hidden crawlers, but could take the leg off Wayno or his comrades. There were pitfall traps and rigged shotgun shells, and Wayno lost a close friend to a shotgun round to the face, probably rigged up by someone who had stopped breathing years prior. He lost someone even closer to him in just a common accident. When firing a shot at a charging feral, it took only one bullet for the building to collapse on top of both of them, and permanently bury the two of them beneath tons of ice, snow, and concrete. They had never made things official, believing it had hurt less if they lost each other. It didn't work. More than anything else, too, there were the psych casualties. The mental devastation of the zombie war broke many, regardless of their faction or caused them to process such trauma in unhealthy ways. One in Wayno's platoon read every suicide note and made a small scar in his skin for each one, getting sectioned when the brass found out. Another time in the suburbs, someone suddenly grinned and broke formation to sprint into one of the ruined houses. When they found him in the old armchair, rifle between his knees and a hole in his head, the family pictures on the wall showed that he'd finally come home. Sometimes the smallest things could break people. There was Wayno's muscle, a professional wrestler before the war, who had racked up a kill count of over 2,000 of the combined parts of the threat pyramid, with some of it using just his bare hands, even using one zombie to bludgeon another to death. One day they walked past a capsized lorry that had been carrying perfume. The smell from the broken bottles clearly reminded him of someone, and he broke down in tears, with it taking four people to carry him out. Their squad leader was a former actress, and one of the leads and the main singer in Roy Elliott's Battle of the Five Colleges. She had cut her hair and replaced the curves with muscle, but still got called Sergeant Avalon by most. They never even knew that she was part Sue, until one day they found a tortoise wandering through a field. Mitakoye Oyasin all my relations. Their combat shrink led her away for a break from command. And so then, just as they reached New York, it was Wayno leading them. Past the news van the tank had flattened in its hasty retreat, past the rusted turnpike where they dug their pointless foxholes, past all the bones and the ash. He was almost glad to be acting squad leader as they went through Yonkers again, it gave him more to focus on and less time to reminisce, being one of the last of his original squad from the Battle of Hope. When he finally got on the barge at the banks of the Hudson, he knew that he'd made it. 
In Chongqing, the good doctor Kuang Jingshu finishes up his final day reassuring a new mother that her child's tuberculosis is in fact just a chest cold. It comforts him to see children again. Their lives are different now. Rules about looking before crossing the road or talking to strangers have been replaced or joined by new ones, like no playing near water, staying out after dark, or not going places alone. But these fit seamlessly with their new lifestyles, one of caution, but safety. They don't live in fear, and Dr. Jing Shu considers that the best gift they can be given, even if their parents always will. He's now the same age as the elderly villagers in New Dekang all those years ago, and has seen the world torn to shreds and rebuilt again after, multiple times for his own nation. Above all else, he believes his old friend and colleague Dr. Quay. Everything is going to be alright. So ends the World War Z story. I hope you enjoyed it. It's not a huge surprise to me that these videos haven't done as well as my normal content. As I briefly touched on in the first video, World War Z was made in a time of peak zombie media, when a lot of it was, if not revisionist in some way, just generally pretty well written and high in quality. It was very much its own genre, and people were generally keen for more of it so long as the content was good. In that respect, World War Z and zombie popularity as a whole are quite millennial artefacts. The crap film adaptation some even view as the beginning of the end of the genre, or at least its popularity. Being the first cheap, low-quality, mass-produced attempt to cash in on the undead, without realising why people liked the genre. Considering this is what much of zombie media became in the coming years, I really can't blame younger generations for not having a very high view of zombie media, even if it's a fault with the stories rather than the genre as a whole. Whilst it differed for the different media that zombies were used in at the time, at its core, World War Z is only partly a book about zombies, as it's much more a book about people. Whilst some segments like Sharon's story work on their own as excellent short zombie stories, and some like Yonkers can relay across an unrelated message but one that uses zombies to embellish it, many of the segments like Jessica Hendrix's, the barely present zombies could easily be removed, but the point and key emotional or story beats would remain. Zombies are merely the sugar in the cake, it's the people who are the flour. Arguably, the zombie survival guide is the book much more about the undead themselves. Even as a faux survival guide, it sets up much of the lore for World War Z, and is often being borrowed from a lot in further media too. At any rate, with at least some of the audience not familiar with it, I'm glad I at least introduced you to World War Z as a story and Max Brooks's writing. So all that's left now is for me to say thanks for watching. And thanks as ever to my patrons. The Super Stuper, Sam Burgo, K Sandum, Holden, Nickname3110, Erengar Steiny, Flygon's Archives, Hui Hui, Original Username, Evilly, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fake Last Name, Zaser, Dodekablos, and Bazugazu Bakuhatsu, Bakumatsu, for their ongoing support to the channel, especially during this period of atypical content. Thanks too to the collaborating artists, to Shockle for the piece depicting the Battle of Hope, and to CJ Broskin for their Quizzling Roundup. The briefs were all pretty challenging, even more so than last time, and everyone rose to the occasion excellently to deliver some truly fantastic art. Without it, this video would be a much poorer experience. The links to their assorted social media are provided in the description, so please do check them out. Likes and shares are always welcome too. If there's anyone you know who may like this series, or read the book when younger, passing it on to others is always appreciated. And for next time, the Monster Hunter content shall resume.